Hi, my name's Drew, and I'm going to be walking you through the Palomino HS750 today. Uh, starting out with the jacks and the operation of the jacks, we're going to talk about the remote here. Uh, now, your orientation of this remote is going to be from the rear. So when we're looking here at the remote, we have your driver side front, passenger side, or excuse me, driver side front, driver side rear, passenger side front, passenger rear, or all the jacks at the same time. Uh, now we are going to get to the location of the actual switch to go ahead and pair that uh, jack mode or that jack remote to the board and get everything functioning going. Uh, and we'll, we may touch base there on the directions of uh, the remote when we get there. Uh, but when we look here at the actual jack, uh, you'll see there is a little red or rubber plug here on top of that. Uh, if we go ahead and remove that plug, that's going to expose the manual drive of the jack. Uh, what we're going to find under there is a 3 8 square drive uh, drive nut. So what that means for you is in the event of a power loss situation, uh, you can use a 3 8 ratchet and extension to go ahead and manually operate these jacks up or down. So that's a very important, something you want to uh, keep in your toolkit with the unit. Uh, also here on the front, underneath the cab over, a uh, few things going on here. We have a battery disconnect switch here. Uh, easiest way to familiarize yourself with that is if you can go ahead and remove the key, you would be disconnected. So, something like that, that would be disconnected. And then if that key is locked on, that's going to be connected. Uh, since your battery here on the inside is going to be in a sealed battery box underneath the step up into the, the uh, bed area, they give you some auxiliary battery terminals here. Uh, if you're checking voltage, maintaining voltage, or, or even essentially hooking up a, uh, a solar panel, you could do so with these, these terminals. If you're doing any battery tending, uh, think of these essentially as your battery terminals when it does come to uh, any battery maintenance or anything like that. Uh, now this battery disconnect switch, a uh, good time to use that is anytime the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days. Uh, we'll go ahead, or, or long periods of storage, we'll go ahead and disconnect that uh, battery disconnect switch like we talked about before. Uh, here you have a seven-way connection. Uh, that's essentially going to link your camper and your tow vehicle as one. Uh, you should have a, a seven-way connection uh, either at the rear bumper or uh, inside the bed, and uh, we just want to make sure you have a cord long enough to reach that. Uh, again, this is going to give you full function to your vehicle's uh, charging system, uh, lights, things like that. Uh, when your vehicle is connected uh, via the seven-way, think of it as one large vehicle at that point. Uh, coming around here to the side, uh, first thing that we're going to come to is going to be uh, the on-demand water heater here. Um, nothing too crazy with this. You do have a main on-off switch here. Now, uh, on the main display on the inside, which, which has all of your controls, uh, it has an on-off switch as well, uh, but that is just for the display. So to turn this unit on uh, so it is usable, you're going to have to flip that switch into that on position. Uh, other than that, a uh, very big recommendation. Uh, these are very susceptible to freeze damage because of the design of the appliance. Uh, we will want to make sure that we do fill this with an RV grade antifreeze anytime there is a chance of freezing. Uh, we're going to get to kind of the meat of the operation there uh, once we do go on to the inside uh, and we will talk about that. Now this does also have uh, a, a kind of winter, winterized mode or I, the, not sure how you would want to uh, reference it, but what it does is if this is on and the display is on uh, on the inside, as long as it has access to propane and, and is, is kind of in working order uh, while it's in storage or, or being used, if the temperature drops between below a, uh, a certain amount, uh, it's going to kick on momentarily. We heat that water to just above uh, to keep it to free from freezing. So couple of options there. If it's going to be in hard storage, if it's going to be left for a long period of time, go ahead, fill it up with, with antifreeze and, and just leave it lay. Uh, or if you're going to be using it uh, periodically throughout those cold months, you can go ahead and take advantage of that built-in uh, winterized mode. Um, 
Beside there, we have your uh, potable water fill here. So we're going to stick a garden hose directly in there. We're going to fill that up to it overflows. Uh, once we're full, we cap it off. And we do need to use that onboard water pump on the inside of the camper to go ahead and pressurize that freshwater holding tank and draw that water to the fixtures, make it usable. Uh, below that, we have your uh, city water connection. You're going to go ahead and use this guy anytime you do have full-time access to running water. Uh, when we do hook up to any city water connection or any, any spigot, uh, water pressure becomes very important. Uh, this unit is rated for working water pressure anywhere between 40 and 75 PSI. Now we do include a water pressure regulator with your purchase. Uh, that is rated for in between 40 to 50 PSI. Uh, if that happens to be, you know, not enough water pressure for you, uh, feel free to, to up that to, you know, again, upwards to 75 PSI, either with a adjustable water pressure regulator or a high flow water pressure regulator. Uh, as long as we don't exceed that 75 PSI, uh, we're going to be in good shape. Uh, and that when you do use a water pressure regulator, whether that be a high flow water pressure regulator or the standard variant, uh, that water pressure is, regulator is going to hook directly onto the water side of the plumbing. So we're going to hook that as close to the water source as we can, and then our hose onto that. And then, of course, our freshwater drinking hose is going to connect here onto the camper by rotating that camper bound connection. This, uh, this plug here, what that does is, is this actually connects directly to the kitchen sink on the inside. Uh, no gray water holding tank for that kitchen sink. So what that means is it uh, essentially just evacuates directly from the sink. Uh, this is a standard garden hose sized fitting. So you can go ahead and route that water away from your campsite. If you're inclined to do so, you can catch it in a bucket. Uh, either way, uh, if you do not remove this cap, it will, uh, that sink's going to back up pretty quickly. Right beside there, we have your exhaust vent for your furnace. Uh, it does blow very hot air when it is on. It is very important that we do let it exhaust. Uh, other than those two very important things, uh, we do want to make sure we protect this from the intrusion of mud daubers, flying insects. Uh, they are attracted to the smell of propane, and they do like to crawl right there into those orifices and get as deep within the appliance as they can to make their dirt nest. So, uh, my recommendation is going to be the aftermarket uh, specifically cut screens for these appliances. Uh, but uh, if you want to DIY something that's up to you, uh, as long as they're protected, uh, that's going to be the, the ultimate recommendation there. Uh, a couple 110 volt all weather outlets, nothing too crazy, uh, just some standard 15 amp outlets. Uh, should just be a storage compartment here. Uh, now all of these compartments do have the, the magnetic hold open, which is a nice feature. Um, but nothing too crazy there to focus on. Just going to stick my head down low, make sure we're not missing anything here. And we do have a couple low point drains hanging out down here. Now those are going to be the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. Uh, those will be helpful to go ahead and drain the unit of its entirety of water. Uh, anytime the unit's going to be in storage for more than seven days, we do want to go ahead and drain the unit completely. So that's going to include the fresh water holding tank, the low point drains here, and then ultimately any water that may be uh, in the, the water heater. So to, to kind of evacuate that, and I would expect to be very little water in there, uh, we're just going to manually operate this pressure relief valve here. So the, the kind of full train of thought with that is going to be, of course, the fresh water holding tank if it's been in use, then come down here and do the low point drains. And then lastly, we're just going to that, flick that pressure relief valve, and that's going to exhaust any water that, that may be stuck there in between. Uh, brings me to our 30 amp 110 volt power supply here. Uh, now this does only plug into the camper one way. We have one L-shaped prong. Uh, as long as we orientate that correctly, this is going to plug, uh, plug in reasonably easy. Uh, once we are fully inserted there, we'll give it an eighth inch turn to the right that locks it in. Then we do have a secondary collar here to screw down and lock it in further. So what we have here is going to be a 30 to 15 amp producer. Uh, this is helpful if you want to check the function of some low draw appliances, uh, maybe pre-cool the refrigerator, something like that. You can go ahead and use this reducer to do so. Uh, this is going to plug onto the wall side of the plug, and this will allow you to go ahead and plug your 
uh, power supply into a standard household 15 amp outlet. Uh, again, this style of reducer is more designed for, uh, you know, at lower draw appliances or short term use. Uh, if we want to go ahead and, and possibly like run the air conditioner for long periods of time or, or maybe run, um, you know, more, you know, more appliances uh, at the same time, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, upgrade this to what they would call as a dog bone style reducer. Uh, what that is going to do is separate the two ends here uh, with about 12 inches worth of cord. Um, what those do is they go ahead and they dissipate heat a whole lot better uh, than this guy here. So this, this little streamlined puck style reducer uh, is not the best uh, tool for the job when it does come to running this on 15 amp service for a long period of time. Uh, moving on, we have your cable satellite inlets here. Now these are just a pass-through cable connection to the designated TV areas of the camper. Uh, standard RG6 cable fittings, uh, and again, this is just a pass-through connection. So some, some uh, higher-end campgrounds will offer a park cable service, and just about every satellite provider is offering a uh, package geared towards RVers. Either way, this is going to be the inlet of those services. Again, they're going to transition uh, at the designated TV area of the camper. Uh, outside shower here, access to hot and cold water, uh, nothing too crazy to talk about here. This, all, this, this hose and sprayer just wrap around the fixture here uh, and they store all in this compartment here. Uh, coming around here to the back side of the units, uh, we of course have um, marker lights up top. We have a uh, porch light, we have a pre-wire for your wireless backup camera. That's the, going to be the Fearon system. Uh, essentially what that means is all the hard work is already done there to add a rear view camera. Uh, essentially four screws, plug and play, and you could then have access to a wireless backup camera. Uh, rooftop ladder access here. Uh, that brings me to a good point, which is going to be unit maintenance, uh, structural maintenance uh, further. Uh, on the body here, anywhere where two pieces come together, you're going to utilize a 100% silicone product, uh, generally paired with some butyl as well. Uh, we're going to want to inspect that every 90 days. Uh, we're going to make sure there's no degradation in those seals, no cracks, no peeling, uh, gaps, things like that is what we're looking to avoid. Uh, again, you can, can source those products generally from a hardware store. Uh, here for the body. Now on the roof, they're going to use something a little separate, which you're going to have to source that uh, generally from an RV dealer or parts house. It's going to be a self-leveling lap sealant. We're looking at, again, those same kind of uh, degradation issues as well. Uh, and we're going to do spot sealing as long as we can. Uh, generally here with these uh, on the body, you're going to have to remove the full bead uh, and then, of course, replace it. Uh, down below here, we have uh, your dump valves here. Now this compartment's probably hard to see uh, on the uh, on camera, but we have a gray water valve there to the left. It is color coded. And then we have a black water valve that's a little further there into the compartment. Uh, black water is of course going to be anything that comes from the toilet. Uh, it's going to be solid body waste, anything of, of that nature. Uh, toilet paper, things like that are going to be considered black water. Gray water is going to be sink water, shower water, relatively cleaner of the two. Now both these valves as they sit are going to be in the closed position right now. To open them it is just going to be a six inch pull straight towards you. Uh, they have this bayonet style fitting here right at the, the opening of the compartment. Uh, that's a pretty standard fitting that's going to accommodate any sewage hose there on the market. Uh, the way you connect your sewage hose is the very same way this cap comes off, which is going to be four prongs along the outside of the tube. You line up the, the lid keyhole in the halfway position, give it a quarter inch turn to the right that's going to go ahead and lock it on. Uh, even when you are hooked up to full-time septic, it is very important that we do keep that black water valve in the closed position. We're going to use the onboard monitor, uh, onboard monitor panel to uh, monitor that level and we're only going to dump as necessary. Very important that we keep that contents of that black water tank uh, in as wet or flowing condition as we can so it will, of course, evacuate that uh, tank and flow down the drain. Gray water, not as important. Of course, we're not dealing with that same solid waste. 
Uh, so that's not as important if you leave that open or closed. Now, generally that gray water tank is going to fill up about two or three times faster than the black water tank. Uh, so often people will go ahead and leave it open. Now, regardless, uh, we'll, those two valves should never be open at the same time. So uh, treat it like a vacuum lock, a vacuum block. Now, a, a popular option is going to be going ahead and dumping that black tank and then uh, closing that off once we're certain that it is drained, and then go ahead and pull in that gray water valve to allow that gray water to go ahead and rinse that uh, black water further down the drain. Um, stepping up here, uh, we have a standard RV style handrail, uh, locks in that out position. In this case, it's just going to fold against the door like so. So here we have your awning. Uh, of course, it's going to, it's an eight foot awning, so it goes quite a bit further out. Uh, of course, we're limited by this unit being here. Uh, we can still kind of talk our way through the operation of it. Uh, now you have two legs up here uh, and they, they do fold out. So we uh, pivot that out with our thumb. That's going to allow this to come down. Uh, now you do have a, a locking tab here. Now once we reach that final position of where we like it, we're going to go ahead and lock that all the way back like so. You also do have, and this, this is kind of hard to see, uh, a secondary detent here uh, that's going to extend that further. Now we have a couple options. We can go ahead and extend this all the way down and go ahead and stake it into the ground, uh, more like a traditional kind of easy up style uh, awning. Or the more popular option is generally coming back here to the trailer bound connection. So uh, these are locking tabs here. So you slide up to unlock them and then we're gonna insert the foot there and lock that down. Uh, it should go something like this. Uh, if we get this to kind of free float for us, we, we put the, da the, uh, the foot down first. So once we are in there, then we're gonna slide that down, lock it on. Now from there, of course, you can choose your pitch. So if you wanna angle that pitch or you want it to be uh, slightly higher, you can do so. Once you get it to where you like it, you just go ahead and hold that back and, and lock that in. Uh, and then on the way in, of course, that's gonna be the same thing for that other leg as well. On the way in, we're gonna go ahead and uh, remove it here from this trailer connection here. And what we're looking here when we're putting it back is we want this foot to be flat against that uh, lid to that awning. And once it's in there, that's going to slide there and keep that locked up nice and tight. Now this is a power awning, so all your controls are gonna be done from the inside there. Uh, lights controls are gonna be from the inside there. So we'll get to that uh, when we do get to the inside. Uh, again, just going to take a look low, make sure we're not missing anything and there's nothing to speak of here down on the underside. Uh, brings us uh, to your refrigerator panel here. Uh, now again, I definitely recommend uh, some bug screening material here on these vents. You want to keep those mud daubers and flying insects from nesting in this compartment here. Uh, other than keeping those, those flying insects out, um, Biggest thing with that is going to be just a visual inspection a couple times a year, make sure nothing's gotten in, make sure nothing's nesting in there, uh, things like that. Uh, now putting this vent on is very easy. We're going to put the tabs up first. So once those are seated fully, it's going to line up these holes here on the bottom. And sometimes you may have to fuss with it a little bit just to get everything uh, locked on tight. So once that's sitting flush, we just go ahead and turn these guys there that goes ahead and locks on always give it a second second check to make sure that it is locked on you don't want to lose that going down the road uh, we have your propane compartment here now this unit runs a single 20 pound propane cylinder uh, same variant you're going to find on most gas grills open and close valve on the top behind that ring there uh, and then to remove the tank to get it serviced you're going to uh, loosen this wing nut here disconnect the pigtail here that will allow you to go ahead and bring that out to get that propane tank filled or serviced. Now this propane tank is full for you today. Uh, when you do go ahead and pick the unit up again, that propane tank is going to be full for you. Uh, just coming around here to the cab over, not really too terribly much to speak of that we haven't already hit on. Uh, you have a battery vent here that again is just for the internal battery box that is in that sealed container. Uh, so that just about covers it here on the outside. We're going to hop on the inside, start going over those features as well. So here on the inside, we're going to start with the restroom. 
A um, couple things going on. Of course, we have your uh, kind of standard RV style toilet. It does have a pedal flush in this scenario. Uh, it's going to be a light press to fill up the bowl and then a full press to flush that toilet. Uh, very important that we do keep some water in the bowl. That's going to help keep those bad smells down. Uh, very important as well that we use a single ply RV grade toilet paper as well as uh, chemical treatments as well. Now, uh, very important that uh, you do use the proper products there. So if you have any questions on, on what to use, what to buy, uh, feel free to contact our parts department. They would be happy to uh, educate you on what you need for there. Uh, other than that, uh, we got kind of a, like I like to call them the usual suspects in here. You got a little storage compartment there. Uh, for your shower stuff, bathroom stuff, things like that. Uh, standard on-off uh, valves there for that, that uh, RV shower head. Uh, and you're also going to have an on-off on the uh, head as well. Now that's specifically designed to help conserve water. Um, and, and you can turn that head on and off and without changing your uh, mix there on the valve itself. Uh, up top, you have your light switch. Now that switch, or that you have your light, and that switch to turn that on and off is going to be right there on the fixture. And then we also have a 12 volt exhaust fan as well. Um, that's going to help draw any moisture from the shower area uh, when in use. Very important that we do make sure we close that before going down the road. I like to make the joke that it's something you kind of only forget once because it's probably not going to be there when you get to where you're going. So uh, to avoid that, uh, just go ahead and close it. This one. Uh, is very easy. You just have that handle uh, and you pull down on it and that is going to allow you to, to close it down. Uh, so closing that door there and we can go ahead and lock it here with this little uh, latch and nylon band there. Uh, we're going to talk about the remote again. So uh, this remote has a little piece of Velcro. It kind of just lives here on the floor like so. Uh, now this board here is how we're going to actually make this remote functional. So we're going to switch that board on. And as long as we see that green light there, that means that this remote, that that board is on and this remote is in that position. Now, again, just to give you a reminder there of the controls, this is going to be driver side front, driver side rear, passenger side front, passenger rear, or all the jacks at the same time here. Uh, now you see you have a little 3.5 millimeter uh, jack there as well as on the remote. So that's designed. Of course, this is battery operated. Uh, if that if this remote were to run out of batteries, you're going to have a cord inside the unit. Looks again just like a, a headphone cord. You can go ahead and connect this directly to this board and operate it that way. Uh, so you also will have an emergency only remote, which is going to be red in color. Uh, that one, however, does not run on battery. So the only way to operate that emergency only remote is going to be plugging that directly into the board uh, like we just spoke of. And then here to the right, we have your, uh, your dinette uh, table and your jackknife sofa. Uh, again, since we're kind of limited on space here, we're gonna do our best to, to kind of demo that for you. Uh, tabletop just lifts directly off of uh, the pedestal there. And then this guy, uh, he unscrews from that base. Uh, when you're and this kind of throws some people for a loop. So, so it, it comes off easy enough generally. Uh, but when you uh, go to put it back on, it can kind of be tough to actually get that to, to catch and uh, actually lock on. So when you start, just make sure you have this backed all the way out until it won't uh, back out any further. And then once you do that, you go ahead and, of course, line it up. And then as you tighten it, it's going to put tension on that screw down nodule, whatever you want to call it, and that's going to tighten it up and keep that there. Um, now with that out of the way, uh, you have a little bit of storage here, a great place for the, uh, for the, um, the pedestal bar there. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, there's not a great place uh, to store this uh, tabletop. So once with that stuff out of the way, uh, we can actually lay this down uh, as a bed and just with any jackknife sofa you lift from the the lift from the front kind of help with the rear and once it goes ahead and lays out it's as easy as that uh, now on the way in uh, very similar uh, but you reach a point where then you have to uh, kind of pull it up from the rear and again you got to get a good hold on it 
and that will uh, seat properly there. Uh, just for ease of use, I'm going to keep that uh, table kind of broken down uh, for the rest of this uh, presentation to kind of keep it out of the way. Uh, emergency exit here, uh, two emergency exits in the unit, uh, both are going to be on the passenger side. So uh, passenger, passenger side, emergency exit here, you'll have one more in the cab over uh, on that passenger side window. Uh, now, if you're particularly motivated enough, uh, you can, or your uh, entry door is blocked, you can exit out these windows. It is very easy to do so. Uh, if there's a screen in the window, go ahead and yank that screen off uh, and, and then uh, you would pull both of these handles in that up position. And that, again, that window goes full open, kind of like a doggy door. And if you are uh, particularly motivated enough, uh, you could exit that way as well. Now, uh, normal window operation, you'll have a little twist knob here. If we rotate that clockwise, that actually opens the window. So it might be counterintuitive to what you would think. So that's going to open the window there. Then if we go counterclockwise, that closes the window uh, like so. And then you'll have these standard uh, friction style pull down shades, uh, very standard. Uh, as these age, they may go ahead and lose some of their tension here. Uh, generally happens. Uh, if that does happen, you can always retension them by pulling some slack out here on the string and just, uh, just so it's, it's taut and then go ahead and, and place that knot further up there on the string that will make those as good as new. Uh, all these lights here in the unit, uh, they are, for the most part, have the switch directly on the fixture, uh, which is going to be dead center of the lens there. Uh, cup holders on each side of the, the sofa, which is nice. And then here on this side of the wall, we have a couple USBs and a, a, 110 volt, a couple 110 volt outlets as well. Um, Coming over here, uh, quite a bit going on on this wall here uh, by the kitchen. So we have your water pump switch here. Uh, that's a lighted switch, so you know it's on uh, when it's lighted, uh, when the light's on, of course. We have your living room lights, which are going to just be, in this case, they are all of the, the, lights, uh, the lights in the camper. Uh, because those lights each have independent switches, we can choose uh, which ones come on and off uh, with this main switch. Uh, we have a porch light that's going to be that rear amber colored light we saw on the rear of the camper. And then we have these awning lights which are the LED light strip uh, on the awning. Uh, this is going to be your awning controls here. Uh, as I mentioned before that you know we're, we're kind of limited on the space of, our, of, of how far we can run that awning out. Uh, but this is a momentary switch so you can choose how far you put that awning out uh, or bring it back in. Uh, down below that, uh, we have your on-demand uh, water heater here. Now, this is going to automatically recognize flow. It's going to turn on and light and things like that. Uh, only real controls you have with this unit are going to be uh, Celsius and Fahrenheit. So we can choose between Celsius and Fahrenheit. Uh, or we can uh, choose the temperature here uh, up or down. Uh, now, when operating these on-demand uh, we call them Girard style water heaters. Uh, what that means for you is that, uh, and, and what I have found uh, in my experience, uh, is they can be slightly unreliable in terms of temperature when, you, when you're operating them uh, in the more traditional sense, which would be uh, setting a, a hot water temperature. And we're talking about right on the fixture itself. So setting a hot water temperature and then uh, using the cold side of that plumbing as like a mixing valve. So what I've heard is that they can be slightly unreliable using them in that, in that scenario. Uh, so what we're going to do is something slightly different. So what you uh, can do is you can set this hot temperature. Uh, you, would, you would probably dial that down slightly lower than you, you generally would. And, and you're going to have a, a lot better reliability, again, in terms of temperature. If you set that to a temperature that you, you find comfortable with, with with only using that hot side. I'm not sure if that, I'm not sure if I'm, uh, that's translating well, uh, but if you, if you set this to a temperature where you don't need to mix any cold water at the valve, this is gonna operate uh, more consistent uh, than if you, you operated in, in the more traditional sense again. Uh, and then up top here, we're going to have your 
uh, suburban thermostat here. This is going to be for your furnace. Uh, all of your furnace is going to come from the blower motor that is down below on the, uh, the kitchen uh, drain board there. Uh, so easy enough is you just slide this to a comfort level. That blower motor is going to come on immediately. 16 seconds after it, 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Generally, in a unit of this size, um, you may find that it sets off the smoke alarm. Uh, that is to be expected within the first 15 minutes of operation. No issues if that does happen. Um, just keep that in mind. Uh, standard run-of-the-mill microwave here, nothing too exciting or out of, uh, you know, it's exciting or crazy there. You're going to operate uh, very much as to what you're probably used to uh, there in the residential sector. And then we have, again, a pretty standard vent and light there uh, as well. Uh, below that, we have a suburban cooktop. Uh, this is, is, is uh, pretty much just a... a, a uh, camping stove kind of set up. There's, there's no spark or igniter. It's, it's pretty basic. Uh, we're going to have to carry a long stand barbecue lighter with us. We're going to go ahead and turn this to light. And then if we have that in that light side, we can go ahead and put our long stand barbecue lighter or our flame of that lighter directly on the burner until it lights. And then we will be able to, uh, you know, switch uh, or choose our intensity of the flame there. Uh, other than that, here in the kitchen, not too terribly much to speak of. Um, get the bamboo countertop extender there with the nice bowl style sink. Uh, hot to the left, cold to the right. Very, very standard stuff. Um, access to, well, that's uh, an access panel to the, the rear of the water heater there. Uh, water pump access as well. Down here on the floor, again, we're kind of running out of space here quickly. Uh, we have your fuse panel breaker box. Everything down here at the bottom is going to be a replaceable automotive blade style fuse. Uh, of course, a very good idea to keep a variety pack of those fuses with the unit. And everything up top here is going to be a uh, standard resettable uh, light switch style 110 volt breaker there. Uh, those are pretty, pretty standard. Your, your fuse box at home probably has uh, some of those as well. In terms of function, everything is labeled there right there on the door. So you'll know what you're messing with uh, in the event that you either need to choose, change a fuse or uh, reset a breaker here. Uh, we have your carbon monoxide LP leak detector here. This is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper so there's no battery to maintain or anything like that. It does have a test button, functions very much like a smoke alarm and it's going to let you know which one of the gases it's sensing. Uh, by the display of the lights on the front. Uh, we then have your GFI outlet here. Uh, this is the main GFI outlet in the unit. What that means is all these receptacles are on the same circuit, and this is going to be the reset point. So if one of those outlets gets overloaded, they all kind of file, file, follow suit. Uh, this is going to, again, be the reset point. So uh, if you see that amber colored light, that means your outlets have been interrupted. And again, we need to reset. Um, removing this access panel, that's going to kind of expose the guts of the unit there. Uh, we have your sealed battery box here. On the inside of that, you're going to find an interstate deep cycle battery. Uh, it is a lead acid battery. So what that means is that there's a water level internally that you are going to have to maintain. You're going to pull both of those vent panels up, uh, inspect the water line, and maintain that water line as needed. Uh, also in this compartment, you're going to find your, uh, of course, your water tank here. We're just seeing the uh, small portion of that. Uh, on this wall here, we have your jack board. Uh, keep in mind that there are fuses on that jack board. Um, and, and probably at some point in time while owning the, the camper, uh, you will have to change some of those fuses. Just keep in mind that, that this is the location of that, that jack board. Uh, water pump is in here as well as the freshwater tank drain here. So uh, if we can get an over top view of this compartment here, uh, looking straight down. And again, I'm not 100% sure if this is going to uh, show up on camera, but we have a little black uh, T-valve there. Now, if I lift up on that valve, that's how you open it. That's going to go ahead and drain that freshwater tank. And that drains that, that, that transitions directly through the floor there 
and is just going to drain that from the underside of the camper. Again, that's going to be your freshwater tank drain here. Uh, also, right below, right beside that, we have a white valve as well. Uh, we're going to use that valve to introduce antifreeze into the system. I, I stress the importance of that because of the on-demand water heater here. Uh, so, so that um, that's going to kind of look something like this. Um, we, uh, of course, we dump all of the existing water from the unit. Uh, and again, uh, to kind of wrap that up, we are going to drain the freshwater holding tank here with that black valve. We're then going to go to the outside. We're going to open up those low point drains there. Uh, once we've done that, uh, we're then going to replace, refill those lines uh, with antifreeze. So we make sure we cap both those lines up. We make sure we close that freshwater uh, drain there. And from there, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take this, we're going to take this uh, cap off of this line here. And we're going to, we're going to remove this and we're going to go ahead and stick this directly into a bottle of RV grade antifreeze. Uh, from there, we're going to use that water pump to draw that antifreeze up through the unit and through the fixture. Uh, most of what we're going to be focusing on is that hot side of the plumbing or that on-demand water heater. Uh, but uh, we do want to make sure we fully we get everything. So we're going to go to each fixture, toilet included, so outside shower, kitchen sink, uh, inside shower, and toilet, and that's just about all on this unit. We're going to open up the cold and the hot side of each of those appliances until we see that antifreeze directly at the fixture itself. Maybe give it a few, few seconds there on the way down the drain to fill up any pee traps or anything that may be holding water uh, on the way out. And, and that's it. Of course, once we're done with that, we need to go ahead and turn that valve in the off position uh, for that water pump to run correctly. So when we're not, we're not using this, uh, that valve needs to be in the off position. And then, of course, this is all covered um, by this lid here. And this just uh, slides there on the underside. I think I might have it backwards here. So uh, something like so. Um, refrigerator here. Now all of our uh, controls are going to be right there on the front of the unit here. Uh, we have on off. Uh, once we turn that on, it's going to go through kind of like a boot up, uh, you know, where everything turns on and then it uh, defaults to the last save setting. Um, so this, this first switch or this middle switch is going to switch between uh, auto and DC. And then this second switch is going to switch between whichever of those, whichever one of those it's on. And then the, uh, it'll switch to the next one, if that makes sense. So if it's on auto, it's going to switch from auto to gas. If we were on DC, it's going to switch from DC to gas. So essentially this third one's how you turn the uh, gas on. And this middle one uh, is going to be switching from either gas to AC. Uh, and then we have your temperature control here. So one through five, the, the more or uh, the higher the number, the colder it is. And then if we encounter any problems with the unit, it's going to illuminate that check light there. Uh, now coming here, opening the door, you're going to see a pretty standard kind of dorm style refrigerator. Uh, it does have an ice box, which is nice. Of course, if that door was open all the way, it would, it would come down. Uh, but very straightforward uh, in terms of operation with that. Uh, now, up top here, we have a couple things. We have your uh, smoke alarm. That's going to be a standard 9-volt smoke alarm um, that does have a battery that's going to need to be changed at some point. Uh, if you have any luck like me, it'll be at the most inopportune moment. So keep a spare uh, with you that way. Uh, of course, you're not going without a battery in the smoke alarm or it's not chirping throughout the night keeping you up. Uh, and then we have your air conditioner here. Now, you can really directionalize where you choose to push that air conditioning. Uh, it does have louvers on each side, and then it does have a main vent that pushes that air straight down. Now, if we're looking here at this display, um, your indicator is going to be towards the front. So that's going to be the starting position is going to be from the front there. And if we go ahead and... Uh, we have three fan speeds. So we have a low fan speed, we have medium, and we have high. Uh, now that's actually going to be the conditioned air. If we go to the other side or this gray side of things, that's going to just be fan. Uh, and then we have a thermostat there uh, to choose our 
uh, you know, level of cool. So, uh, very straightforward, very customizable. You can really choose where you send that air. You can also add an optional heat strip if you would like an electric heat option. Um, coming up here further into uh, the, the cab over area, uh, here on the right side is going to be your uh, TV, or kind of like your multimedia uh, space. Uh, of course, the unit does not come with a TV installed, uh, but that would be installed dead center here. Uh, what we have also is a charging center that's going to be a couple USBs as well as a 12 volt uh, cigarette lighter style receptacle there. Uh, and then below that we have your antenna booster. So we saw the inlet of these services uh, there on the outside. Uh, this is where they're going to, this would be the outlet of those services, those park cable service or, or satellite uh, services. Uh, you see this red light and button. What that does is on the rooftop you're going to find an omnidirectional digital over the air television antenna. This is just turning that antenna on and off. Uh, idea being is that with this red light in the on position, you're gonna do a channel search. It's going to automatically search out the best possible options in terms of signaling, and then bring in channels based on that. Now for utilizing this same line here is for a park cable service, which they do share that same pathway, then that red light does need to be off to allow that cable signal to bleed through. This one here on the top is gonna to be utilized for satellite. Uh, this would ultimately connect to a receiver and then your receiver would connect to your television. Uh, now these three uh, aux cables down below, that's going to be for your DVD player. So think of this as essentially the rear of your DVD player, although the actual DVD unit is going to be located here. Uh, now this is CD, DVD, AM, FM radio, uh, Bluetooth. All of that is going to be done with this single unit. Um, and find most people are generally pretty familiar with these. You have a single mode button here, a Bluetooth pairing button here. Um, you know, you have your, your seek and your find here, play, stop, uh, presets here as well. Uh, 3.5 millimeter inlets as well as USB inlet here. Uh, and then we have zones one and two. Uh, so you're going to uh, control the volume of each zone separate. Of course, one is going to be inside, two is going to be those outside speakers there. Uh, this remote is going to be paired with this unit uh, that will allow you to control that remotely. Um, also in this area here, uh, coming up further, uh, we have a fantastic fan above my head here. Uh, again, this is one that is very important to go ahead and close. Uh, when in use, let me go ahead and rotate my head there so I'm not kinked. Uh, and it does have an unlock tab. So I know this is very hard for you to see from down there, but if we go ahead and we, we unlock this tab, uh, that will allow us to go ahead and open the lid here. Uh, once we have that lid open there, uh, we can go ahead and choose our... Um, our speed. So you have three speeds there. This is an exhaust only fan. It does really get up and start moving air significantly. Uh, the idea being since it is an exhaust only fan uh, that we're going to open up these the windows of the unit and it'll allow this to, to get a nice cross breeze for us. Uh, other than just the, the large amounts of storage up here into the cab over, I do just want to finally point out that here to my left is going to be your second emergency exit window that is going to operate slightly different. So you have a, a, uh, a handle here. Now that handle comes out. And once that handle comes out, uh, you can either operate that as a, uh, you know, standard window. So you can have a single position window there. Uh, or again, in the event of emergency, you can go ahead and remove this screen. Uh, and that window is going to come fully out like a doggy door. So uh, that is going to be your emergency exit. Uh, so that just about covers the inside here of the Palomino in terms of function. Um, and we do hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you do have any questions or concerns, uh, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, we'd be happy to walk you through that over the phone. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great day.